start with. Uh, there will be source code and running stuff. I have demos. I don't know how prepared people came to actually try to follow along with some of the stuff I'm going to do. The source code is available that I'm using on a memory stick and it's all going to be downloadable. Um, looking for my memory stick. Won't get involved in that right now. But how many people have installed vPython, Visual Python, in this room? Excellent. Did you raise your hand, sir? No. Okay. I started to. I just started I to. I haven't quite gotten all the dependencies. Yeah, seems. no, I know what you're saying. I, I don't know if it actually works. Like, okay, excellent. I, because it's, it's, no it's not super easy um, to install, uh, unless you're on Windows. But if you're doing some... Uh, so I'm going to start with slides and then get to source code and then go back to slides. I've got my ro rotating cube here. Um, so I have a number of presentations already lined up that are going to be similar to this and partly what I'm doing in this uh, tutorial, which is kind of unlike a normal tutorial in some ways, and partly why Steve is here and the chairman of Python Software Foundation and so on, is I'm kind of an interloper in the Python community. I, I'm a philosophy guy from Princeton University and Wittgenstein and all this kind of stuff. And why am I even doing Python? That's the kind of thing people want to know. And what am I doing with Python? And how might I be risking the reputation, uh, besmirching the image? I don't think I am, but you guys, I want to say that I touch base with the home front here so that you guys know what I'm up to and can help me kind of fine tune what I'm up to. So this is partly for you to give feedback as somebody who's out there representing Python to a lot of teachers who've never heard of Python and they're still stuck on that whole open source thing. What's that all about? What's that Linux thing? Didn't that go away when there was that dot com thing? And then, and then there was a bust and Linux went away, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing people are thinking. They're, they're, 10, 20 years behind. And if you go into a high school today and you look how they're teaching math, I'd say 10, 20 years behind. And what I'm trying to do here is bring the world that we live in and somewhat take for granted out into uh, the world that I live in where people don't even know what Python is. However, I want this to be a relevant talk in terms of what if your job is to teach other adults? I think in many cases, if you think of our, our role as the Dilberts, in the Dilbert cartoon, I come to a conference like this, everybody's Dilbert. And the point here, bosses, there are not that many here, and they don't really understand. So there's a town gown thing that I'm trying to bridge at the adult level. So at the child level, or you could say up through pre-college, I'm trying to be accessible to that age groups. But my pedagogical techniques phase over to where I'm also talking about andragogy. I bet you don't know that word, but pedagogy, of course, has the root of child in it. And you don't, I heard Steve say pedagogy a number of times, and of course that's okay to use in terms of talking to adults, but andragogy is a word out there, and I tend to use it also. So how to bridge the pointy-haired bosses and the Dilberts is part of what we're talking about. I think of Google as kind of a paradigm because with all that Google University and stuff they're doing on YouTube and stuff like that, they're out there as a private sector company trying to reach out to what I would consider in a way my clients who are people pre-college who might like to get into this engineering thing they hear about. They're attracted to open source, they're attracted to something, they're not sure what. And right now, going to Google and looking at those talks is one of the best ways to figure out what's going on. But why can't you get it in school? Why can't you go to school and even hear the word Python or SQL or a lot of things? And my, my basic approach when working with adults as well as we can't take the lore for granted uh, when we're out there in the world. In other words, when you take Python and bring it out into, say, a math class in Peoria, Illinois, you want to bring that whole lore of open source with you and encapsulate your Python inside a bunch of stories. It's not enough to just say, okay, we're all going to learn Python. And that's the problem that math class currently has. Everyone agrees right now that the math pipeline is broken up to college between kindergarten and college something happens where a huge amount of people decide I would rather be a beautician or even a mortician than stick with this math crap. It 
just is boring and beyond that is stupid and beyond that it makes me feel stupid and everyone who goes ahead with that is some kind of freak anyway. I mean there's a lot of alienation around math and this is a problem people know about and one way to fix it I think is to bring this whole culture that we take for granted somewhat and its excitement and yes even its romance and bring it into the schools as kind of an alternative track at first or alternatively have alternative schools that use it as their main track and I kind of represent one of those schools called Saturday Academy that actually teaches Python as a way of learning math. We're not here primarily to learn my Python, we're here to learn math and Python is a tool for that. Now by examples of stories, uh, this is Hillsborough Police and the Saturday Academy. Here you've got a group of well-meaning police out in Hillsborough, which is where Intel is based. Hillsborough is a sub-community of Portland, Greater Portland, but it's where our high-tech Silicon Forest has a lot of its fab plants and so forth like this. And you got a lot of, say, Latinos and other people who are in America for, for the supposed land of opportunity, and they're, they know they're in a high-tech capital. Portland was advertised in Christian Science Monitor as open source capital of the world maybe, but at least an open source capital, Portland, Oregon. So here's all these kids who want to learn this stuff, and they go to school and it's not taught. The best they do at school is scare them, tell them don't copy stuff, it could be criminal, you might go to jail. There's a lot of intimidation, chat rooms are dangerous, you don't know who's going to be there, they're only pretending to be 14. Um, in fact, the police had me as one of their gimmicks pretend to be one of these kids. They brought in all these Latino kids into the police station They had them all doing IRC and they were chatting happily about, you know, this, that, and the other. And then they said, now wait, one of these people in here wasn't one of you. It's some creepy old guy 40 miles away. Who do you think it was? And they go back through the blog or go back through the transcripts trying to find out which was the imposter. And that was me. But, and, it, and I, they couldn't figure it out, so I was good. <laughs> but. But the thing is, the police, the chief of police here in Hillsborough is a Chinese immigrant, first generation. He knows what it's like to, to want opportunity and to, to, to move ahead in the world. So he said, let's just set up a Red Hat Linux lab right here in the police station and invite teenagers to come in. And the police will teach you Linux. Why not? Just because we don't want you to grow up and to be into drugs and gangs. We want you to have fun. We want you to enjoy. Anyway, they were thinking the schools were falling down on the job and they would take over. Now, the weak spot in that whole story is teenagers don't want to go to a police station for any reason, including to learn Linux. Number two, the police didn't know Linux, so they had to hire, uh, and when I say Linux, that's kind of just code for open source in general, because I'm not a super Linux guy either, but you know, I, I had a friend teach with me, uh, Jared Cullard, who was the head of Linux.org at the time, LinuxFun.org, and he knew it. So the, between the two of us, we did a bang up job and the police sat there and watched us teach open source and how would we do it? You know, we're not afraid of the internet. We're not telling them to be so paranoid. And so George Houston, this former F FBI guy and all there, is sitting there watching me teach. And the first thing we do is like their worst nightmare. Jarrett pulls out a packet sniffer and says, this is how you pull down TCP IP off, off the Wi-Fi. You know, this is, how you, this is how you can spy on people who don't encrypt. And George is like, his mouth is dropping, but really, this is what you want to know before you can really be safe on the internet. You kind of have to understand how it works. And a the theme of my talk is one of the reasons we teach all this stuff, the new numeracy, I would call it, GNU numeracy, if you want a pun, is how things work is important. How does Fandango work? How, when you buy a ticket for Britney Spears concert, does that work? You need to know a little bit about SQL. Just a little. I'm not saying turn them into computer science. It's too early to be into computer science. Uh, in the math class world, I used to be a math teacher, uh, a lot of the emphasis on the story problems is they shouldn't have any content. Just make them think about Farmer John and this fence, he's trying to maximize his area. Who cares who Farmer John is? Why does he have a fence? We don't give a, you know, the, pro the problem, the, pro the stories are supposed to be irrelevant. And I'm saying that's a whole huge waste of bandwidth. All that lore, all that culture, all that stuff that's not going to get taught if we don't ta teach it. Uh, you're wasting their time if you don't bring in the real world, so-called real world. Math class is like too proud of not touching the real world. Way too proud. So you got to use the real world. Who is Richard Stallman? These kids aren't going to learn that. All the stuff we've been through to create this whole open source c culture could die because who's going to teach it? It's not being taught right now. 
to a large degree. So I feel a sense of responsibility to move this on. I do think it's okay to use fiction, but you know, my whole beef with television today is it's all fiction. The cop show, the doctor show, the, every, the lawyer show, they don't show the real world, they show this bizarre world. And then when you actually want to be one of those things, like a doctor, it's hard because you realize it's not all house MD. Um, but here's kind of a, a diagram I use in teaching that I think could be useful to a lot of you. And I'm taking these kind of two axes. Uh, Steve, if you ever want to butt in at some sure. point, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I want to monopolize. I just kind of get on a roll here. That's perfectly OK. OK. okay. So um, here we have the lore axis. And here we have being very technical. Here we're talking less technical out to more technical. And this line, I would say, represents we admit there's limited bandwidth. It's not like somebody who's in front of the room like myself has any higher bandwidth than anyone else. Or even if we do, if we have different bandwidth capabilities, that would be different lines. We don't have to figure that out. We're not comparing people here. Just whoever you are, you have a certain bandwidth. And if I'm being very, very dense and technical way out here teaching you meta classes uh, with a C++ spin or something, uh, you're not going to at the same time be wanting to follow some intricate story with lots of characters. Like if you're, if you're reading War and Peace, you don't want one of the characters to start explaining, or maybe you do, but for the, for the time that that character is explaining something technical, your bandwidth is over here. And I'm saying as you give a talk, you need to oscillate. You need to vary the mixture, keeping in mind that people have a finite bandwidth. They're going to be very unhappy if you're out here with Bob, for example, thinking they can be that plot thick and that technical at the same time. You can't do it. Bandwidth is a problem. Um, I just heard in a recent lecture, ORM, Object Relational Mapping, some guy said that's the Vietnam of computer science, which I'm <laughs> just saying so it gets on tape. I hadn't heard that before. I think that's very funny. Partly why I have Bob here, and you don't—you have to go searching if you don't know who Bob is, but he's a mnemonic device in my talk. But I think the irreverence of the open source community is most, or the most, sort of the self, that we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we do take ourselves somewhat seriously, is when you ask, what is open source all about? What is Linux all about? Why are we here? Why are we doing this? The standard answer is what? Does anyone know? If you ask, say, Linus Torvalds, what's the point of Linux? Why are we even doing it? You know, the, the, the answer you're supposed to give is world domination. Obviously, we're here for world domination. Now that, it's kind of funny, it's self-spoofing. And this Bob guy is kind of a self-spoof too. But when you read in the New York Times, for example, they say there's now just a slight uptick. People are starting to get back into computer science or kind of getting interested again. Enrollment might be ticking up again on that because it's been in a plunge, it's been in a nosedive ever since that dot-com thing. Uh, they say, yeah, kids are back to dreaming they can make a billion dollars and retire at 30. It's all about making a lot of money. And I think that that's because they don't want to say that world domination thing. We're not in it for the money, we're in it for the power. Anyway, um, here's taking the lore axis and splitting it out into two. This is all lore now, but when you're telling a story, you've got your complexity axis, and then I've, I've just picked another axis that you could pick at random, but I would call it its sort of its spiciness. I use the H HBO rating system here, and then I have various topics. I think when geeks give talks, we're generally out here. We're being very complex. We're not doing much that's like R-rated or above. I can, I can assure you there in most of our storytelling. I would put Narnia and Buffy, and these are like TV 14. Uh, it is something of a problem though with Saturday Academy, for example, I tell people they need to go home and download Python, and they go to python.com, you know, it's like, mom, you know, why the teacher? Anyway, lore <laughs> is why am I here, and skills is what am I doing? And in a typical math class, there's a lot of skills, maybe, but I think way too little lore. And so as we move in to take over the math curriculum using FOSS, using Python, using all of our tools, as we start teaching this instead, displacing a lot of that pre-computer math, uh, we're going to have a lot more lore than we used to. Now when I say taking over and all that, I'm just kind of playing off that world domination theme. But as you can see from my premise in the handout, and if anyone didn't get a handout, I have some more up here. 
that basically I'm following Kenneth Iverson of Harvard who invented the APL language. This is way before Python and I was interested in this whole way of thinking going way back before Python. I was into geometry. I'm really into this esoteric geometry that I'm going to talk about a little bit. Partly why I teach math and geometry is because you know I'm into this Buckminster Fuller stuff and he's got an exhibit right here in Chicago the guy's dead, but his life's work is being displayed downtown, and I'm going to have to figure out when to take off time from PyCon to go see that, because it's pretty important in my little reality, Neither and I hate missing any talks. So I'm thinking I might wedge it in Sunday before the plane, but I'm worried about missing my plane. But in any case, um, I got to Python because I was studying geometry, and I was going through Visual Fox Pro XBase doing geometry in that, I got some stuff published in the Fox Pro Advisor because it was so strange to have somebody doing x base and geometry. Then I tried Java for quite a while, I tried Scheme for a while, and then I got to Python. Now I think the kind of lore that we're getting in the Python culture is indicative. It's a little edgier and a little bit more adult, I would say. It's not just for children, I guess you could say, and yet it's funny kind of Calvin and Hobbesy in a little way. You've probably all seen this cartoon. It spawned a lot of t-shirts, but the guy's saying, how come you're flying? He says, it's because of the Python. And then they go through some things about why Python is cool. And then how do you know it's the Python? Uh, well, I just, uh, I also sampled everything in the medicine cabinet for comparison, uh, but I think this is the Python. So, you know, it's kind of like, what, drugs or what? What are you talking about? Uh, so to get a little more edgy, uh, this is especially interesting. My, my contention is what the science fiction writers of the last generation did not anticipate is that computer languages such as Python and so forth would give rise to their own subcultures and anthropological phenomena. Global subcultures defined around computer languages. Who would have thought that? Well, here we are. You know, This is where we live. In general, the open source world has its own heraldry, its own symbolry, its own anthropology. This is all the things you look at if you're an anthropologist. Here's some of the heraldry. So if you're an open source person, you should be able to decode this, right? There's the GNU, GNU is not Unix. There's the Penguin, and where's Python? Well, that must be Python. Now, I haven't finished decoding all this. That's the Pearl Camel, obviously. Elephant? Is that an elephant? And what the? PostgreSQL? Or is that a horse? Is that? <coughs> As Postgres, and what's this shield? It's like an African shield or something. See, we don't even know. Here we are, and we don't even know. These are Canadians, you know, they're a little bit ahead of us. And that whole thing about the piracy thing, aren't you, like, if you're open source, aren't you a pirate? Well, we kind of take that seriously. I wanted to just, let's flip to my blog here. Be a patch. You think that's a patch? You think, because, you know, it's the stack. It's, a patch. Right? it's the stack, you know? <laughs> yeah, lamp, right? You know, I say Portland is kind of an open source capital. Well, here's like what we're into in Portland. You know, are we into pirates? You know, this is just a typical gathering uh, of the so-called pirate festival. But like, here's like a little kid with a pirate flag and a stroller. So I think that that thing where you, you fight open source by saying they're pirates, I think the counter to that is to own that because we like being pirates, we're into that. But then we make fun of the whole idea that we're really stealing stuff because since when did a pirate ship pull along another pirate ship and just copy everything and leave? I mean, you still got the gold, you still got everything you had, and they took off with a copy. I mean, it's really kind of a joke. Um, as far as Brittany, uh, well, you, that is a python, you must admit, okay? <laughs> Part of our creating the culture is that like these conferences like OSCON and so forth, I love this talk by Larry. I was there for this, I did find a reference, but every so often I think of these wonderful like circus acts, center ring, it's like lions and tigers aren't as good, and Larry is brilliant, and Damien Conway and all these people. This is our culture, our lore, is it all gonna just fall through the cracks? I mean, I'm glad to see video recording happening, stuff like this, but I think the way to get more kids enrolled in a nice future is to share the vibrancy of this culture that we have. Okay, so now here's where I need some feedback. Here you guys are, Python. We got the chief of the Python Software Foundation sitting next to me. What I tell people when I'm talking about heraldry, symbolry, the fact that we have our own anthropology, 
is people ask, where is Python Nation? They haven't even heard of that before. And I think you have to admit there is a Python Nation because we have a dictator. I mean, how can you have a dictator if it's not of something, right? So I think Python Nation makes a lot of sense. I use that in my writing. Then we have our, our flag. And people say, so where is Python Nation? I say, well, it's right next to the Republic of Pearl. And to prove that, I point to this little windmill. And, you know, Guido's Dutch, right? So I'm just saying, look how close it is. There's Python right there, right near the camel. This is Pearl Land here. And you just go that far, and there's Python Nation right there with the dictator Guido. I mean, doesn't it all make sense? So is that why this windmill's here? I mean, does anybody know? Why is there a windmill here? I think it's because Python, right? It's so close. A reference to Quixote, perhaps? What's that? A reference to Quixote, perhaps? Yeah, a reference to Don Quixote. Okay. Don Quixote. Okay. Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Tilting at windmills. Okay, so, so the word we use in geekdom is repurpose. I'm repurposing the windmill. It's now, it stands for the Dutch origins of Python. So, but I, I can go with both meanings. It's a namespace thing. So, you know, when we teach this culture, we need to reach into history. We need to give them perspective by them. I mean, people are coming in learning this stuff. So like sometimes when I have the time, not necessarily here, I would tell this story, what I call the rise of structured programming from the spaghetti code west. This goes back to when a guy, when Ada, the new language Ada Defense Department was coming out, I was at Princeton, and there was this guy who would take me to Ada conferences just because it was a phenomenon. He wanted me to witness it with him. All these people streaming into rooms like this to learn about how they're going to be required to write a compiler compiler or what's going to tell if their Ada compiler was good, and they're all like, oh, it's the only way we're going to make money in the new world. The Defense Department standardizing on Ada, whatever. And that was kind of the ultimate structured programming thinking, but he recalled back when Dijkstra used to come to rooms like this with career programmers sitting in the audience who'd only been doing assembler and Fortran, and you have to use spaghetti code. At the assembler level, at the assembler level, you've got to jump. You've got to jump. I mean, there's no way to have code do something conditionally unless you can have a lot of jump statements. So you grow up from that to Fortran, you're going to use the go-to, of course. I mean, it's just in your mind to, to write a lot of spaghetti code. And so to have this guy Dijkstra come along and say, no, we shouldn't even use GoTo, uh, that was like people would get up and walk out of the room steaming mad, is what he told me. This guy who was touring me around the Ada world was saying he remembered those talks. When the structured programming sort of paradigm came out, people would get steaming mad. And I think we have to realize that, like object-oriented, all these sort of paradigm things, people do get religious and they do get hot when you things... Have to, you have to remember as well, I mean, Edska Dijkstra was neither the no, most modest nor the most approachable person in the world. I mean, he's quite an arrogant guy, and so therefore, you know, when he told you you were wrong, he was likely to put you back up anyway. All right? He's much less personable than Kirby, for example. If Kirby tells you you're doing something wrong, he will do so in such a way that you can retain your self-respect. As Edsker Dijkstra wasn't. Another point I would make, by the way, is although languages like Fortran and Assembler are not necessarily languages that encourage you to do structured programming, the nature of structured programming is such that once you understand it, you can actually do structured programming in, in any language. The value of languages like Python is that they simply don't allow you to program any other way, really. They encourage it without you know you having to learn it it just you absorb it with the language if you like absolutely the good habits are just ingrained in the yeah. design right now, i've never i have never seen any, any video of dijkstra or anything i don't know what he was like no I, he was before the video I was invented you know well not right <laughs> maybe maybe on youtube there's some anyway i tell this story you can make a link the spaghetti code west gets me thinking about that tv show kung fu with david Carradine. and come anyway never mind um, now here, the rise of SQL, you don't have to call it that, but there's a whole other story here, and I think this is where, I, if I'm like in the humanities, if I'm like a history teacher, and I want to do a hook into the math content, and I'm saying SQL should be part of math, when you do that Venn diagram stuff, what's this for, teacher? Why are we doing Venn diagrams? Well, if you just had a little bit of a terminal window and you could just pull up some SQL, this might be a good time to actually do a little bit of source code and get off this sort of 
pedantic thing I'm doing. Let's see if I already have Python booted and it fights me because of that. Let's go to 2.5. Yay! No, it's already running. Somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> Did you do a control alt delete and select it from the task manager? Thank you. See, that's where you're That's where they pay me the big so bucks. That's why right? we got some <laughs> So let's see if I can just pull this up. SQL polys. Okay, so here's some source code. My ideal is that math teachers, as they become familiar with this stuff and as a cottage industry of the internet and passing stuff around, you can file lesson plans anywhere. I don't regard myself as like writing the sort of textbook code that everybody's copying. I am more an example of here's a math teacher who's trying to get across some geometry. Here's one way you could do it. And go ahead and use my code if you want is the attitude. But if you want to write your own kind of stuff, you know, it's just not like you have to use my code or something stupid like that. But uh, I do tend to use idle a lot. You know, I like the, I don't like the black screen kind of thing a lot of people use. It doesn't work for video either. But anyway, what we're doing here <coughs> is we're going to draw a polyhedron, which looks pretty clear. But we're going to do so by pulling data out of a SQLite database. And I'm thinking, you know, we maybe have a whole week, two weeks to do this in a real math class. And really we're focusing on polyhedra a lot. But this is that one time to get some exposure to what is SQL, uh, what is it about, what is the history. And this is where I talk a little bit about the darkness uh, in this slide. Does anyone know what I'm alluding to? It's basically the whole idea of a holorith machine where you have punch cards and you can get everybody's ethnicity and then run it through really quickly and just have it spit out a stack of all the Jewish people, for example. And this is the technology that we are now seeing how intimately IBM was involved, for example, in the Nazi program. And they haven't denied it, actually. At this point, it's like, yeah. Um, so the whole idea of keeping tabs on people that's where we get paranoid. It's like, who's got information about me? What are they using it for? I'm not trying to suppress that. I'm saying when you get to that point in the curriculum, when you're talking about SQL, this is a good time to start talking about all that stuff. Bring it up. Have people get paranoid. Yes, we are spying on you. We do know your mouse clicks. Uh, yeah, they are getting all your keystrokes at work. Whatever, all that stuff you're afraid about computers and those evil engineers, I think why a lot of people don't want to go into engineering is because those are the bad people. Those are the people who spy on me at work. They know what my keystrokes are. And the less you know about technology and how the internet works, the more you are prey to your own fantasies about how it works. Uh, because in actual fact, my experience is geeks like us are highly aware of security issues, very respectful of each other, and we build in a lot of security and protections because we're, we are paranoid and we deal with it in a thoughtful, thinking way. And I'm trying to impart some of that culture and responsibility to, the, to, my, to my students. You know, this is what any college should do, and I'm talking high school as well. So let me just run this. I think I have a test at the end. I don't, I can run it anyway. Let me explain a little bit what it does. We can actually go into a terminal Here's where I should blow up the font. And I don't know what it means when it says control plus plus, because when I try that, it just types control plus plus, right? Control plus plus. Got control plus is what you want. Control shift and plus key. Control shift <laughs> and plus key. Plus. Ah, control. The first plus is and. Is a shift? Control and plus. There you go. Okay, so this is my top level table, and imagine here you are in high school, you're learning about select statements, do a little bit, select, update, whatever. Um, I got my polyhedra here. I have a short name for them. It's kind of weird to call a rhombic dodecahedron a cell, 
but why not? It's actually a space filler. The rhombic dodecahedron fills space without gaps. It's important in my curriculum. And then I have V, the number of vertices, the number of faces, and the number of edges. And Euler's law, V plus F equals E plus two, you gotta know that. If you don't know that by the end of high school, then I get polemic, I get rhetorical. I, I often use the word joke school, but I only do that when I'm trying to get people riled and inflamed. Um, and then I have the last column, which is my volume. <coughs> and you're gonna say, well, that is not right. We don't have nice whole number volumes like that for these shapes. If you've done geometry, as you probably did up to a certain point, you do not recognize a tetrahedron as having volume one and these other guys being so nice. And that's one of the innovations I'm bringing in. We're making a much friendlier geometry here because as long as we're overhauling the curriculum and bringing in an active math notation, basically what Kenneth Iverson said, I know I'm kind of tang uh, tangential here, I'm kind of branching off, but what Kenneth, who invented APL, a programming language, what he said is, is basically two kinds of math notation. There's math that just sits there on the page, and there's math that runs. There's math that executes. And there's all kinds of notations. I mean, if you go to a math library, like Fine Library of Princeton, it's a math library, there's three floors of math books. And each one has its own notation. Okay, some share, okay, but notations come and go, just like people say. And that's true with math too. It's not just computer languages where they talk about flavor of the month. It's true with all math language. This idea that there's one static math language that's this totalitarian sort of fascist solution to all problems, it's a false thing. So think of APL as a math language. It just happens to execute. And that's what Kenneth Iverson was saying. Let's look at this as math and it happens to execute. So I'm going out there saying, let's look at Python as a way of expressing math concepts, no less than what you see in a textbook that doesn't run. Here's just another way of expressing these same ideas, but hey, it even runs. So, so that way, every Python teacher is a math teacher automatically. You're all blessed as math teachers. Go forth as math teachers. Okay, um, so we have another thing. Okay, my facets, I won't go into this in too much detail, but basically the way that you uh, specify a polyhedron is you take its facets, which means its faces, and so here I am at a cube, I'm gonna pick one of the squares, and I'm gonna go around either clockwise or counterclockwise. So I need to number my vertices. Like I'm saying, here I am at facet 11, my cube octahedron has 14 faces, eight of them triangles, six of them squares, and here I am on a square face, this square face, face number 11, has vertices 0, 1, 2, and 3. Those are my four vertices going around that square. And then I get a letter. And that letter is a lookup in a Python dictionary to an XYZ vector. So basically when I specify a polyhedron, I say what all its faces are, and my routine has to go in and distill the edges and the vectors out of that and draw them. That's what my whole source code does back there. And one of the sort of side results of doing that is, okay, where'd Python go? Did I kill it? Isn't that Python that you're doing the SQL stuff in? No, that was a terminal window. Okay. There it is. Okay. Why doesn't it show up? Oh, there it went away. So let me just import this. And this will be a first test uh, visual, which is vPython, which I think is really cool. It's a very, it's called 3D Programming for Ordinary Mortals, and it's a simple API. It's hell to install, but once you've got it installed, you can start working with uh, teenagers and getting fun things on the screen right away so that when the parents come to pick them up, in my case, that's how it works, they say, look, mom, look what I did in the first class, and they're looking at something pretty interesting. Of course, there's scaffolding involved, which means they don't start from scratch. They start with a lot of source code, and then they just tweak it. So what I'm going to do when I say draw, draw polys is I'm going to go into my... Um, I'm going to go into my database 
And basically, the first thing I'm going to do for any given shape is I'm going to ask how many faces does it have? And then I'm going to look that up in that F column, that faces column. And then I'm going to use that to go and get edges. But the thing is, when you, um, when you get edges in this way, because you're specifying a face, there's going to be a neighboring face that has a shared edge. In other words, when I go to a square and I go, this point, this point, this point, and this point are the four points of that square, then the program's going to figure out, oh, well, the edges connecting those points is this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge. In other words, from those points, I can get the edges, but every edge gets specified twice because faces share an edge, one edge. So there's a problem of getting rid of the duplicates, and it would take a fair amount of training before a student can actually parse this and read this and understand what's going on. But one of the things is I'm using a set to get rid of duplicates, and that's kind of fun. You probably use that trick yourself. But when you set something to be a set and you keep feeding it the same thing over and over, it throws away it, except for the first time. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm sorting the edges so that they have their, you know, an edge would be like A, B. So if I try to stuff A, B, and B, A into a set, it's going to work because A, B, and B, A are different tuples. Think of an edge as a tuple. And so if I'm stuffing tuples into a set of edges, uh, if I sort them in alphabetical order so that B, A, and A, B are always going to be A, B, then I'm going to get that collision that I need so that I don't get any duplicates because I'm using the sort order, alphabetical sort order, going in every time. Does that make any sense? So if I go draw polys and I give a shape like cell, uh, yeah, thank you. So this is what vPython does as a result. And what I can do with this is zoom out and rotate and zoom in and stuff like that. So vPython is very cool, I have to say. And let me, as a sort of an advertisement for how cool it is, here's something I wrote that takes a little bit of more uh, code, but it's still fun to see. This one actually has a stereo. When I did this at OSCON once, I actually had the blue and red glasses, and I handed them all out. I won't do it this time. Uh, so this is all written in Python using vPython. What's interesting about these polyhedra that I'm showing is that they have the proportions that I need them to have in order to have those nice whole number volumes. This is what I call a hypertune. Sometimes I do a lightning talk on a hypertune. The idea is you have certain key frames, like imagine in a cartoon, a key frame is like where Donald Duck is smiling in a certain way. You had the master cartoonist do those. And then the in-betweening is all the little half shots that go between one key frame and another. And what a hypertune does is it scatters a bunch of key frames out there and then creates these like a subway map, like a subway map of Chicago or New York, where all these trains go between the key frames. And every time the playhead gets to a key frame, it randomly picks what other key frame it could go to based on what trains leave this station. So you basically have two playheads in this system that are run as threads, and it's running around inside the subway system, connecting polyhedra by various in-betweening methods that I wrote. Uh, there's kind of a dictionary structure that says if you're at this station, the next place is the trains could take you. If you're at a tetrahedron, you can get to a cube. If you're at a cube, you can go here. So each polyhedron is kind of a key frame, and then I have transformations out from each one. Anyway, that's just vPython, and it's kind of its glory. We should move on. So we were talking about this at lunch again. When we talk about Unicode, I think we want to talk about <clears throat> something positive, not something negative. Like SQL, I was going to get a little dark there and talk about evil. Here I'm talking about how we're all collaborating around the world so that we can all program in all these different languages. And Python is leading the charge in that. And I feel we should be proud of that. And we should be out there kind of selling that feature. Here was me in Lithuania when I gave a talk similar to this one, but different. And I boot up my blog to write. 
it's mostly the same, but Google's smart enough to start putting all this Lithuanian stuff in here, which I thought was cool. It's kind of culture shock for geeks, though. Um, so this is what you can do in Python 3. This is just a silly little class, um, but the fun part is top level I'm using Chinese, and idle smart enough to, uh, to show the fonts correctly in this particular font. It's, it's a bit of a hit or miss thing. You can't just take any font and expect it to show you Chinese. You have to get the right font. Um, so yeah, you'll see that the class name is a Chinese character, and here <clears throat> the attribute is a Chinese character, and uh, so when I instance the class here, now does this make any sense in terms of the words I'm using? I don't think so, really, because I don't know Chinese, but maybe. Uh, and then cryptography. Um, telling the whole thing about RSA and I have to talk more to Ian about the difference between Diffie-Hellman and RSA. But I think this is an exciting story that we need to teach. And so I also get into the source code here. Let me just show you quickly another example. Uh, I think this is in Python 2. Sue 5 will work. So when I get to this part in the curriculum, imagine now we're dealing with a four-year high school curriculum here, and you only have three hours here. I'm going all over the map. I'm showing you we get into geometry. We're doing vectors. This is all stuff that's in the current standard. You're supposed to know something about polyhedron vectors. It's just I think it's inevitable that once you have a flat screen two feet in front of your face, and they call it a math class, and you're sitting there hours of your life learning math with this kind of CPU and not a stupid calculator, which doesn't have any real power. Once you've got power in front of you, you're going to want to go to, to spatial geometry. All this flat stuff is just not going to be satisfying enough. So once math class is all about computer power, we're going to go to polyhedra. So I do put a lot of emphasis on that part of this. Uh, but we also need to do group theory, number theory, stuff like that. Because one of my goals, and I think I could share this with a lot of people, is you know this calculus that we do, calculus pre-calculus, is kind of a leftover. I mean, we don't all need that, and we don't. We turn a lot of kids off more than on. Part of what's broken about the math track is all this ETS enforced AP Calc and all this stuff. I'm not against calculus. I have an example of teaching it with Python if we get there. Uh, but I do think we need more number theory and stuff like that. So as a goal for 12th grade, by the time you finish high school, if you're on the math track, you need to understand how RSA works, why and how. It and just, a little bit again, goes back to motivation. You know, how do you actually persuade kids that math is useful? And the answer is not to give them, you know, theoretical problems about areas that they not, know nothing about. Right, because you can to tell them that this is... them with right. real world problems. This is very real world. You can tell them RSA is in every browser, um, and you need to tell the story in a way that's accessible, and I found that this, this is kind of a nice way to do it in that I use an already cracked RSA number, as you know, and this is already exciting to the kids. I can show them that web page where they have these big numbers that if you can factor any of them, they'll give you twenty to $50,000, and they're like, whoa, you know. So, and this is a case where the German Federal Office for Information Security has this breakthrough on, on a certain day where they get their 20,000 because it took them five months and finally they factor this gigantic number here into two primes. And what's so cool about Python, and I use this example to try to blow the calculators out of the water because it's calculators that I think of as my competition, not like Ruby so much, but calculators. Uh, I can go from RS, I'm gonna have a polluted namespace here because I'm going to bring in all this other stuff. Broken pipe. Maybe that's 2.6. 3.6. Using OS.system or something like that? So, 
looks like Python is dead, and yet, where is it dead? It's one of those things where you need to kill it in the background. I think what I'm going to do is punt until break and get my Python working again then. Continue going through these slides. So those are the stories. Um, I might allude to this later. So when, when you're starting fresh teaching, like today, if you're learning how to use a telephone for the first time, or if you're a country implementing telephones for the first time, you don't start with a landline. You start with a cell phone system. And I think today, if you're just starting into object-oriented paradigm kind of thinking, you don't start by learning a lot of procedural code. When you get into math class and you want to start learning what Python's about, I think analogies from biology work a lot. And I think of primitive types as like our atoms, actually scheme uses that word, and then data structures are kind of like molecules, and then you're getting up to more like unicellular organisms when you're talking functions, generators, stuff like that. And then when you get to organisms, you're into the class world. And organs are like sub or like methods maybe. Um, I include I I like the first person instead of saying something is a or has a. I like to say I am a and I have a. In other words, use the I first person to get into this object thing some because you two. This is one of the things people don't like is engineers objectify everything. But I think. Not to be defensive about that is a good thing. Um, when I start with the hardware, like with the police department and stuff like this, we don't start right away with the internals of the computer. And if this is really a math class, and sometimes it's more of a hybrid, but we want to get into the network first and start talking about the anatomy of TCP IP more first, because that's shared infrastructure, shared hardware, just as much as what's in your box. And I love to show Warriors of the Net. If you haven't watched this, it's a great cartoon, it's free, and it's all about how TCP IP works. It's got these little trucks that fly around, and you may remember, I think it was Senator Ted Stevens is the guy from Alaska. Somebody said, oh, uh, he said the internet is just like a bunch of trucks and tubes or something like that. And everybody laughed at him for that, but I think he just watched this movie, and he was correct. Because it's all about little trucks, little and that's got routers, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, and then we could tell them about data centers, that whole lore there. Because in Portland, uh, where we live, if you believe in a place-based curriculum, that's where you do a lot of your lore around your local geography. What's true about our neck of the woods is we have the Columbia Gorge, which is this huge, huge river, as you know, that goes into the Pacific. But they had to dam it, they didn't have to, but they did and they flooded certain sacred sites and fishing sites and all this, and we have a lot of memorials to what used to be there. Salilo Falls is gone. There's a lot of sadness about Salilo Falls being gone as of 1957. But what did they put in place of Salilo Falls is they put the Salilo Dam, and what does Salilo Dam power? Google, big, big data center right there plugged straight into the dam, because if you're Google, you're looking for a dam to plug into, basically. You've got a lot of uh, wattage needs and Amazon's doing the same thing. They're building a data center right there along the gorge. So the gorge is becoming this place to plug data centers into dams. It's kind of what it's getting to be kind of for. So we talk about all that stuff, kids like that. So this would be like my hello world. If I'm trying to teach Python to a complete newbie, I don't start with a lot of procedural code. I go straight to this. And what I do, and this is where I'm interested in, in uh, Steve says, under for these things. Double under. When I used to go to Python talks, it was under, under, and it. And now we have the shorter one. Double under is dunder. Because you take under, under, and you take the fact that it's doubled, and you say dunder. But, so that's dunder and it. But what I've been calling these, and I think it makes a lot of sense, is I call these ribs. Because they look kind of like ribs. And actually, you can look at this as kind of like a body. And instead of biotum, you can mentally think a snake. And a snake has a lot of ribs. If you've ever seen a picture of a snake without its skin, it's all about ribs. So I'm thinking python, snake, ribs, 
and then it gets me to everything is an object in Python, but you can also say everything is a snake in Python, because everything kind of looks like this with lots of ribs. And so that gets me to the mnemonic that I would say, which is everything is a Python in Python. And it actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, here we're saying, here's a biotum, and all it has is an empty stomach to begin with, and I use the call because of, I don't have to, I could use the eat method, and when you eat a food, it depends into the stomach, and kids get this, and they start playing with it. The first thing you do is you instance it, and you start having things eat each other. Now, just before you go on to that, yeah, yeah. When, you talk, when you say here is a biota, yeah. in fact, what that is, is a recipe for creating biota, isn't it? Right. Than a biota. Right. Actually, the analogy I often use, and you've probably heard from other teachers, is it's like a blueprint, and it's like building a house. And if you have the blueprint for a house, you can build that house anywhere, and you can build it over and over, and each one of those houses is an instance. So yeah, that's the instance for a biotum. And then we, uh, not the instance, that's the, the blueprint. And then we create these instances with their empty stomachs, and where how I do my sequence, and I have videos on this that show me, show me do and stuff like this, but I think a very good place to start is to have it be biological. Really do have it be so that they can empathize with these objects because you two are a biological being and dwell on the biology and uh, start with like a monkey class and a dog class, which is what I do. And then as a second stage, create a mammal class and show how you can refactor to take those uh, eating functions and stuff like that and put them up in the parent class and have the subclasses just have a repper. So you're just saying, I'm a monkey named whatever, I'm a dog named, and all the eating and instantiation goes, goes into the mammal class. So the way I get across polymorphism is I create a human and a dog and a monkey as separate classes, and they see the codes duplicated. They see these are three different creatures, and then they see that how when you get a mammal out of it, you, uh, you know, then you can subclass those. The point of starting with biology and something warm and fuzzy is A, we're not talking about computers here. We're getting across that when you think in Python, you're thinking about the world out there. You're not thinking about chips and registers and all this kind of stuff. You're thinking about your knowledge domain. So this is a good, good way to start. And then the second thing is, we're getting, we're warm fuzzy here. We're talking about creatures. They're imagining creatures. It's that same technique where we teach how when you read a book, gradually we take the pictures away. Not because we don't want you to have a visual imagination, but when you look at lexical stuff in a book, we want you to be able to imagine at the same time. So that as kids grow older, we gradually take away the picture books and we hand them books with less and less pictures. It's not that we're being killjoys, it's we're showing them you can think and imagine as you read. And I think that's the approach we need to take with a very lexical activity called programming. Too often, we try to make a big cartoon, everything visual, drag and drop everything, and you lose that ability to imagine while you read. So I think having starkly lexical is okay, but you're imagining stuff. And then when we get to math, it's the same exact thing. We have objects. Instead of having biotums and cells, we have vectors. Those are objects. Polyhedra are objects. Everything is an object in Python. And okay, here's how am I doing on break? Are we ready for Oh, that? plenty of time yet. You got are we up to it yet? No, 20 minutes yet at least. Okay, here's another example of a pedagogical, or I'd say maybe andragogical technique. Here I'm taking some American history maybe, or you could do it, adapt it for something else. It's kind of self-parody, I'm being a little self-spoofy here, but we're trying to get across using the private uh, modifiers in Python. You know, when you want something to be a little bit of private, we'll say that's so watch out. And we got a snake here. Snakes don't like to be stepped on. So here's the back off, and that's when we use the double underline, and I put a don't tread on me here. But I'm kind of tying this into some American history, you might say. I have other histories in the background. So one of the tracks, when we're doing very lexical programming, and I think I would like to get into permutations right now to show you a little bit more what I do, is Okay, again, this is a four-year curriculum, let's say, a high school curriculum. We got a lot of time. It's not like a workshop like this, but RSA is our goal. By 12th grade, we want to have that understanding. How do you get to RSA? 
you've got to understand the difference between prime and composite numbers. You need the uh, common denominators, uh, modulo numbers. Oh, I remember, my Python's not working very well. So after the break, we'll do some real code with this. So that's track A. That's very lexical. Um, it's kind of an add. Okay, well, here's some code. Like for doing Pascal's triangle, um, I like to use a generator there. This is a very simple generator where you start with the first row as one, and then you append a zero, you prepend a zero to the front of that row, so you have a zero one list, and then you post fix a zero to the end of that row, and then you zip them together. So basically where you had one, now you have zero one and one zero as tuples, and you uh, add those together. So if you take one row of Pascal's triangle and basically left shift it and put a zero in front, right shift it and put a zero behind, and then just add the term straight down, you get the next row of Pascal's triangle by adding vertically. And you can do that in one line of Python. So as you say next, next, next on this Pascal, you get successive rows longer and longer of Pascal's triangle. That's a very fun little technique. It teaches you zip, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, again, we would gradually get to this. You don't spring this on them in just one session. When I go back to Portland, I'm set to teach a course just like this uh, in April. Uh, so this is, like I actually do teach this stuff. It's not like, wouldn't it be nice? It's like kids come to me and I tell them, this is what the Silicon Forest, you know, our kind of industries out there would really like you to be learning because like Intel can only find 19% of the people it wants to hire locally in the greater Portland area. Everyone else has to be imported because there's just not enough people learning these skills in their regular everyday school. And so they come to my class because I kind of represent sort of behind the scenes maybe a different way, a different way of learning math and it involves using open source. So Fibonacci is just four lines and uh, you can seed it with different numbers. Fibonacci, you don't have to start with zero, one but this will spit out your Fibonacci numbers. And the cool thing there is your Fibonacci numbers converge as you, as you divide one over the following one, you get to uh, the golden mean. I don't know if you know that, maybe you do. Track B, I was talking about the lexical track where we're really you know, more like algebra. And then the graphical track is more like geometry. And we do a lot of linking of geometry to geography, which is why there's a lot long there. When you're talking about earth measure, that's geometry, you're talking about the earth. And geometry comes from, you know, surveying and being Egyptian and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so we definitely want to tie this into the GIS GPS thing. And a dream I have is right in Portland, we have a company called Immersive Media that has those dodecahedral cameras that have 11 lenses on the back and a backpack. You go for a hike and it streams everything to your hard drive you take it home, you stitch it together, and you get one of those movies that as you walk through the forest, you feel like you can turn in any direction, even though the guy who was taking the movie uh, is just looking forward. So they put this on the back of a downhill skier, and then you can watch the movie, and you can turn around and look backwards. You would not want to look backwards in a downhill ski situation, but you can in this kind of technology. So I bring that story up because another goal that I have that I share with a lot of people is I'm tired of the idea that math always means something you do inside, pouring over, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, your muscles will atrophy if you're involved in math. That's kind of the attitude. And, and I try to do a more of an outdoor component to a lot of what I'm into. Um, I market Portland in various ways, a kind of a booster for Portland. We have a lot of cartoonists. Uh, the Simpsons comes out of, Matt Gurning is from Springfield, which is part of Oregon. And although he didn't name Homer after this Homer, uh, Springfield, Oregon is where one of the great political cartoonists of our time, Homer Davenport, comes from. This is a small town south of ours. Uh, this is one of his famous cartoons. These are like the Catholic schools coming to, to eat the poor public kids. They're kind of like, help. this is back in 1871. But this guy, Homer Davenport, invented the donkey for the Democrats and the elephant for the Republicans. If you ever wondered where that came from, it came from this guy. You know, this stuff has to be invented. That's the thing about lore. It doesn't just happen. You need creative people to, to invent it. Sorry. 
Yeah. Um, this is the Vatican. That's the Vatican, okay. Yeah. And the guy on the right, is he a priest protecting the children? No, he's he's an upstanding public school kid who's protecting the children. So who are the priests in that picture then? These are the bishops. They're sharks. Oh, okay. Their, I can their see hats them. are open. Right. I call them bishops. Okay. I didn't see that. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. They're all coming on shore. See the alligator? Is that a first summer in the situation in Brazil? Where's our Brazil guy? He's, he took it off for a while. Well, this is 1871, don't forget. So yeah, the, the font I'm using, uh, this is called Akbar font, and it's modeled on Matt Gruning's, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, the guy who invented The Simpsons, this font that I'm using is based on his handwriting. And I kind of, I find it child friendly or kid friendly. So all the way through here, I'm using Akbar font. How do you spell that? A-K-B-A-R, A-H, A-K-B-A-R, I think. Is it an open font? Yeah. Is it open? Yeah. It's freely downloadable. Whether you can go in there and mess with it, I don't know. I'm not a big font. Whether you, whether you have to pay a license fee. Not to you. Well, I'm not paying one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you, you've heard how I use the word rib. So I'll talk about the call rib, the init rib. It's actually less syllables than saying dunder init. You say the init rib or the call rib. And that makes the whole thing, where you have a bunch of ribs, a rib cage. So you can talk about the rib cage of an object. It's all of its ribs. And that, again, reinforces the idea that everything's a snake, or at least a creature. We did that already. And then track C is where I'm kind of unifying track A and track B. And uh, this is where we can talk more generally Supermarket math. Another way you can talk about SQL is just you know make it all very mundane. But like when you go shopping and you scan things out, the barcodes, people can relate to that. Kids can relate to that. You go and you buy that Cheerios. That's one less Cheerios on the shelf. When you scan that out, something decrements in the back office somewhere, triggers the reorder. We all read these stuff in the textbooks, but you know when does it ever? By the time they get to college, most of them have already decided they don't want to be engineers. That's the problem we're addressing. The idea here is by telling real world stories using math that actually operates, actually runs, we're regalvanizing and reinjecting life, and we're doing that world class education that certain people in Washington are promising that we're going to do. But my, mine's more grassroots than that. I'm not trying to go to DC and tell them how to, how to run their thing. I'm just teaching this. Uh, and others. What I want are more teachers to realize this could be their ticket to a more exciting future. If you're used to sitting there with bored math kids day in and day out, what's this for, teacher? Uh, the next test, you know, so you can get into a good college. If you get this kind of stuff going, they actually want to come back. I actually have kids burst into tears on the last class because they have to go back to their stupid, boring math class. Yeah. My understanding of when the new math was introduced. It failed, not because mathematically or even pedagogically it was bad stuff, not because the students couldn't adapt to change, but because the teachers couldn't adapt to the change. Have you proposed basically a mechanism by which you can have people who will be doing math, who will be deep enough into Python and deep enough into math to be able to teacher-wise handle what you're talking about? Right. So the question is, didn't the new math, any new math, fail because of teacher backlash? And I often call this new math, GNU math, kind of a pun. Where are we going to get the teachers to do this? Now, teachers are wanting higher pay. They also have in-service training. They're actually paid to go and get skills upgrades. There's the ingredients of a solution there. When I was getting into teaching, uh, I went started teaching in a Catholic school, as a matter of fact, in Jersey City. I was doing graduate courses with an eye towards becoming a high school math teacher, but most of the math teachers in that room were studying this kind of computer stuff because they were going the other way. It was like one of those disaster movies where you're heading into it and everyone else is on the, on the other lanes, five across, trying to get out. It's like people are, are running out of the math class as teachers because as soon as you get these kind of skills, 
The problem isn't necessarily giving them the Python skills. The problem is as soon as they have it, they stop teaching and get a better job that pays more. So that's the challenge. And I think teachers like to hear that because, oh, if I start getting these kind of stripes on my resume, maybe I can still be a math teacher, but maybe they'll pay me a little more and give me more responsibility. Actually, the math teacher faculty should be the system operators for the school. The math teachers should know enough, they should be geeks enough, that they can run and administer a lamp stack, for example, I would think. Uh, it's a big social change. I'm not saying we're going to be there tomorrow, but my attitude is capitalism and competition. I am creating schools with help from others, like in Alaska, Matt Sioux District, other charters, where we are implementing stuff like this, and we're basically just saying, you know, we're beating the pants off the competition, and you deal with it. You figure out how you're going to do it, because we are going to teach this, and we are going to prove that it's better. That's kind of the aggressive way to say it. But really, I want to be diplomatic, and I'd like to have an army of the people who come to PyCons. I would like more of us to have the job opportunity to go out there and train those teachers, because you don't need a, te a teacher's degree to train teachers in teaching Python. So you could do this tomorrow. I wouldn't need to give you a degree in anything. Uh, anyone in this room is qualified to teach teachers Python. So here's kind of like you're saying, I call it new math. And that's kind of a symbol that there's Unicode behind it. But this is also kind of an allusion to new math because the reason new math got started in the 50s and 60s was because, do you know why? Why was there suddenly new math? Why was there a need for it? What was the sparking of that? Cold War. Sputnik. Cold War. Cold War. Yeah, Sputnik. Both are correct. So I'm putting a bit of a reminder in using a Cyrillic character here of you know, what the bleep, the Sputnik made kind of a bleepy noise. So that is a lot of subtle stuff in here. But this is kind of a list of topics. I'm not saying it's exclusive. But these are the kind of things that we need to cover. We don't have such a nice expression of Euclid's algorithm in his uh, that's something we all use. But who even knows what Euclid's algorithm is? Same thing I talked about last year, a year ago, in this very conference. You should be able to go and look state by state and see which ones even put that in their so-called standards. Most of this state standard stuff is just cut and paste from other people's standards. It's like, you're, you don't know that much. You're just sitting there in your legislative chambers, and Kansas needs a standard. Well, let's see what Minnesota's doing, that kind of thing. And it's not very pretty. I push the XO a lot. It's a good picture I took. Notice how I'm doing advertising for OSCON. This is a picture that goes around quite a bit. These are people trying to raise money for kids. They're very appealing, I think. And they, I got them to hold one of my XOs. I said, will you post for this picture? Show me your binder. I'll hand you an XO in my OSCON bag. And uh, I'll take this picture. So marketing. Um, yeah, Pascal's triangle. See, what's important about Pascal's triangle is you get the figure it numbers in there. You know what I mean by figure it numbers? One of the way cool resources uh, that you may not know about but should um, is called the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. Anyone know about that? Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. So what you can do here is type in any sequence of numbers that you think might be interesting, and like the Fibonacci numbers or whatever, and it'll give you all the history, it'll give you citations, if it is indeed an interesting sequence. And the one that I use so much that it's already in here is 1, 12, 42, 92, 162. This is, if you take a sphere, like a ping pong ball, you can pack 12 spheres around it. There's more than one way they fit, but one way they fit is a cube octahedron, volume 20 in my little SQLite demonstration. The second layer of spheres has that same shape. In fact, all the way out, it's always a cube octahedron, but the sequence is 12, 42, 92, 162. That's how many balls you get in each successive layer. Really easy and really fun to write a one-line Python generator to do that sequence. Why is that sequence important? 
because you are building when you build when you pack spheres in that way you are creating the basis of crystallography and all this other stuff it's called the face centered cubic lattice that way of packing spheres is kind of the gold standard in many areas of science it also turns out that those that same sequence works for icosahedra for reasons that involve a cartoon where I can distort a cuboctahedron into an icosahedron, you get the same numbers for an icosahedron. And if you scroll down, partly why I use this page a lot, and I'm proud of it, is because in the links section, you have a certain K earner here. And if you click on him, he goes somewhere totally unrelated. Okay, then you get to my microarchitecture of the virus page. And here I talk about all this sphere cap packing stuff. There's the 124292. Viruses have these counts in their protein capsomeres. So we're back to biology here, talking about icosahedra. And we're also back into my familiar territory of Bucky Fuller. Because when people first use x ray, uh, diffraction on a virus and they saw the scatter they realized they're dealing with something like a geodesic dome except it was a sphere which is where Bucky started too he did not start with a dome he started with a sphere so they went to him and they said can you tell us anything because we're looking at this thing and he told them about this formula which Coxeter who's another geometry at University of Toronto thought was really cool and you can prove it with high school math so Fuller was pretty sure he was going to get famous at that point because they put in the New York Herald Tribune that Fuller had this formula and they actually published the formula. But by the time Scientific American came out to publish this whole story, they would found another mathematician named Michael Goldberg who had a little more of a general uh, formula and they found a way to write the whole story where Fuller was omitted entirely. And there's a lot of intrigue there. I made a, I've made a lifetime studying why such an uphill battle, why so much work to get this guy's stuff into the world. And uh, so it's, you know, partly what I do is, is also bring this stuff into the world. Uh, 15 minutes to the break. 15 minutes to the break. Um, here's a kind of a diagram of how you could think of the curriculum. I mean, we all doodle, okay, so why would I just take a normal doodle? Well, I put a lot of stress on this, I blog about it, I use it over and over to help people kind of figure out a, kind of a roadmap to a certain way of teaching. But like down here, we've got our relational databases, we're explaining about SQL. That's our link to the supermarket and how I just said when you buy the Cheerios and all that. But we're also talking about <coughs> the uh, energy and the economics of how sunlight gets transformed into plants and that goes into the supermarket. So Dorian Sagan and somebody wrote a book called Surfing the Solar Gradient. Basically what we're doing here on planet Earth is we're using the energy differential of the sun to surf, basically, the solar gradient. And uh, so we want our students, when they learn math, to link it in to that biological place in the world where we eat. And I use eat a lot as a primitive method in my biotas and all that. But that's where you you hook in all that stuff about calories, which are jewels. If you go to South Africa and you look on the uh, packaging, I don't know if it's like this in the UK or not. Do you use jewels or calories to measure food energy? Kilo calories. Kilo calories. Because in South Africa it's jewels. So you look on a box of milk and it's so many jewels. But anyway, basically, you want your math to also be about energy. Uh, I know Ian's into this a lot. Um, and here we're talking about domain and range, this kind of stuff where you teach the usual stuff about functions. Anyway, I don't need to go into too much here because it's kind of just, this is where I teach this stuff. This is Linus Pauling's uh, personal archive or collection. Linus Pauling is uh, an Oregonian we're very proud of. He got two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry, one for peace. And this is his special collection in uh, Oregon State University where he has all kinds of polyhedra, including the one I was just talking about. This is that cube octahedron, and this would be one, two, three frequency. So that would be 92 spheres in that layer. Um, so here we are in kind of the graph track where I'm using 
um, I'm using my Python to do my polyhedra. And they're getting in there and tweaking the Python. One of the easiest things to do if someone's already written the code is to start messing with the colors at least. Uh, sometimes I use Wing. It's got a free version. And you can do Akbar font. What do people think of using this crazy font for source code? See, I think it's kind of crazy, but on the other hand, it's kind of friendly. So I'm actually using Akbar font here to write the Python source code, and it actually runs. And it's kind of friendly, right? There's a section in Knuth, right, in the early volume of Art of Computer Programming, where he shows you that grid of squares, and he says, yeah, but if you just tilt each one just a little bit, isn't that nicer? And so, same kind of aesthetics here. Uh, there we are using Pascal's, or yeah, this is the generator in action, generating Pascal's triangle, like I was telling you before. <coughs> Goes back, there's Chinese version. It's very old, this math. They call it Pascal's triangle, but. And here we're doing the Fibonacci's. If you take successive Fibonacci numbers, which is very easy to do if you're using a generator, because if you just put, you know, gen f next over gen f next, that's the previous over the next term. Each time it fires, it's doing the next one. So you can put them in rapid succession with a slash between them, and you're not getting the same one each time. You're getting the previous and the next Fibonacci number, and you're dividing them. And as you do this, you approach a limit. As you go out to Fibonacci numbers, which as you know, one, one, you add those two ones, you get two. You always add the number before. Two plus one is three, three plus two is five, five plus three is eight, eight plus five, like that. As you do this, you approach the golden ratio, or actually one over the golden ratio. So in terms of geometry, it's very important to uh, talk about the golden ratio because of where it comes up in five-fold symmetry, like with the virus and the icosahedron. You need to understand about these particular angles. The reason I put the 108 there is because that's some, or the reason I refer to Lost. Who, who here watches Lost? You know about 108? Okay, well, and you know they find a geodesic dome under, so hey, I'm decoding it for you. Yeah. So on a pentagon, if the edges are one, any of the diagonals are phi, uh, which is the golden ratio. And, you know, as an American and somebody who pays taxes, when they came out with No Child Left Behind, NCLB, because it's a namespace, I'm thinking, in Python, uh, why don't I just create, since I'm trying to help here, I'm trying to be helpful, I'll create what I'll call the No Child Left Behind polynomial, which is the polynomial you have to solve to get phi. So I have all this writing out there about the No Child Left Behind polynomial. I even have a No Child Left Behind polyhedron. Of course, the political people in charge of NCLB aren't necessarily happy that I'm out there agitating in this strange and offbeat way, but it is interesting. By the way, all of these, um, I'll get back to this after the break, but the fact that these, well, these edges here are, are actually cylinders, of course. And what I want to talk about after the break is what I call claymation geometry. Uh, or geometry of lumps is what I'm going to call it, where we think of everything, points, lines, planes, as all being made out of clay. And we don't distinguish between how many dimensions they have. In Euclidean geometry, it's like points have zero dimensions. You can't see them. And if anything I show you is not going to be a point, uh, because you can see it. It's not a point. You can't see points. You know, this is a kind of weird way to begin math. We're going to tell them that this is the truth. And as little kids, they really fight this, because You've got this authoritarian older adult telling them all this stuff about invisible points they're never going to see. And they're not prepared. They're not philosophy students. They haven't learned rhetoric. They can't argue back. And there's this frustration of but, but, but. And by the time you get our age, you're too old to really care anymore. You're not going to go back and fight with those math teachers. It's like you got a career, you got kids, you got a life. Well, right, people like Ian here, and a mathematician, flew all the way from England to be here today, and myself, we go back and fight. And Bucky Fuller also. He goes back to those math teachers with, you know, 20, he had 11 honorary degrees and 20 patents. The guy is just bristling with credibility, at least in his own mind. 
And he goes back and he says, wait a minute. He starts fighting with them in his own mind. But anyway, we'll get to, back to that later. But I just want to say this is one of my paying Python gigs. I haven't made a huge amount of money coding in Python. But all these ray tracings of these plastic, this was for a toy called Strange Attractors. And you would get these metal balls. It's a lot like Roger's Connection. It was the same factory that made Roger's Connection. Uh, and then you have these plastic rods. And the cones are actually separate. You stick the cones in the, edge, in the ends of these plastic rods and the cones have those very strong magnets on the end and then you click the magnets into the steel balls and you can build polyhedra or you can build these flat things. And my task was to help with the packaging and the instruction booklet and to get very nice photorealistic ray tracings using Python to write the scripts that would in turn do the POV ray renderings. So these are not phot photographic, these are just rendered uh, cylinders and those balls and so forth using Python code to do that. Um, here's kind of a fun cartoon while we're on the topic. This is kind of how I think pre-object oriented people time kind of think of addition. They think of numbers, this is a good story to tell kids who are learning the new paradigm. They think of numbers as totally stupid. They don't know anything about addition. Inside a number there's nothing there. Numbers are done. And things like addition, multiplication, it's like these aliens, these are little aliens. It's like coming from another planet and saying, I will, I will teach you to how to multiply and subtract or add or whatever. You're just dumb numbers, that's why it's saying dumb. Okay, in Python, it's way different. All the numbers swallow their own abilities to add, multiply, it's something every number has internalized. So the numbers one and two, instead of being stupid, if you do DIR1, DIR, put one in parentheses. We do this right away when we start a math class. Let's look inside the number one. And they're used to thinking of numbers as stupid. No, numbers are like snakes. They have a rib cage. They know how to add, they know how to multiply. It's inside every number to know this. It's almost instinctual. Interestingly enough, I was giving an advanced Python tutorial this morning and I found that I always find that the, the best way to demonstrate Python's capabilities is just to interact with the objects in real time in front of an audience and you can do just the same thing at a simple level and people, you know, students will, will pick the idea up. I also you know, approach it kind of from the other side. I mean, one of the things Kirby does is he tries to bring the real world, Python to, to real world people. I sometimes try and bring the real world to Python people and, and try to, you know, get them to engage with real world problems and the real problems of teaching and pedagogy rather than you know, some of the, the abstract things that they sometimes try to uh, approach instead. We've got uh, five minutes, I think, before the break. Okay. Yeah, like I say, what we'll do after the break is more actual source code, running, interactive, uh, but because my Python's fighting me, I have a dead Python as a process. Rather than try and kill it in front of you, I will just reboot my computer during the break. Um, but one of the things I like to do, back to track one, which is the more lexical track, is to set up numbers that multiply with each other modulo something. So that when you take M A times B, it, you can just use the actual operator. That's the cool thing about Python, and not Java, for example, is that you can override the methods, the ribs. And that's considered an advanced topic in computer science, for example. But since this is math class, and we're trying to learn about group theory, we want to see that when we take the, the numbers that have no factors in common with 12, like 1, 5, 7, and 11, if you multiply those numbers modulo 12, you have total closure. You can add them, you can multiply them, and they'll never fall out into another set of numbers. They will always be within that set. So you can, and if you take a prime number, everything under that is a totative of that prime. In other words, if you're dealing with 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, all the way down to 1 are all, quote, totatives of that number, which means they have no factors in common. They're relatively prime. And therefore, when you multiply them together, you always have closure. And when you add them, you actually have closure. That's a Gaussian field. Actually, when you, if it's not a prime number, you don't have additive closure. So it's not a field, it's just a group. But you get into this stuff pretty early. Abstract algebra is so much more accessible when you can overload the operators. Because now what you're thinking is, 
what do we have in common when we multiply two matrices, when we multiply two permutations, which I do? There's a, a, there's a meaning for that. They get to this in college. Like I was saying last year, we have this thing called Calculus Mountain that people often fall off of and hate. Well, at the same time, around the back of that mountain, there's some nice group theory stuff that on an easy level, there's nothing really hard about it. And once you have Python on your belt, you can experiment with operator overloading and you figure out that why we call it multiplication is because the idea of multiplication is there's something that's an identity, the number one, that if you multiply anything by that, it doesn't change it. Also, there's a thing called an inverse, that if you multiply a thing by its own inverse, you get that identity element, one. Same with addition, except it's zero. So you teach them that abstract algebra stuff, and whereas in the old math, that would be considered way too abstract, way too college, if you've got Python staring you in the face, you can just start playing with a class where your numbers are already set up to do all this stuff. I don't have a power method here, but you can also raise them to powers. Why would we do all that? That's how you're going to get to RSA. You're going to understand how public key encryption works because two years ago you started messing with this. Again, we have like four years to go through this. So here I'm showing how I've got a group. These are the totatives of 12. These are the numbers that have no factors in common with 12. And I generate these math facts at random. Every time I do next, 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 I'm getting out another random multiplication of any two of these numbers, and I'm just showing closure, the fact that we always get back a number in that group, and so forth and so on. Closure checker, Euler checker, blah, blah, blah. And this will be after the break, geometry lumps. Okay, it's break time. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. See you back. I think it's pretty good because it shows you can imagine playing this clip in a classroom where you're starting to introduce public key cryptography which I've said a number of times is a goal of this curriculum that I'm brainstorming with others I would say Neil Stevenson's book you might have read Cryptonomicon but this whole way of going back and looking at World War II and the recent history in terms of cryptography is very good because you keep the math front and center and yet in the background you've got the whole sort of uh, storyboard of recent history so telling the story of cryptography uh, has a lot to recommend it but it has to be understandable and I think this clip is pretty good for that so let's just roll it's pretty short and then I'll do my little RSA song and dance with source code. I'll have to switch to another computer to do that. Get Big Fast was really important for us. It was our critical strategy and the reason is we knew that we could offer customers a better experience if we had a certain amount of scale. Absolutely essential to getting big fast for Amazon was convincing customers to trust it with some of their most valuable personal information, their credit card numbers. And to understand how Amazon did that, we need to delve in to the age-old science of encryption. Powerful methods of scrambling messages mathematically had been developed long ago and employed most famously during World War II. But it was clear that something much more sophisticated was needed for the new digital age. The old method needed an upgrade because there was a fatal flaw. To explain this flaw, let's use a low-tech analogy using padlocks instead of mathematical encryption. First, imagine two people, and one wants to send a confidential message to the other, just like a customer wanting to send her credit card to Amazon. Person one, the sender, puts her message in a box, locks it, and sends it off. But here's the snag. The sender of the message now also has to somehow let the recipient know the lock's combination, the code to unlock the padlock. This step is fraught with problems. This is when thieves could surreptitiously observe the code, steal it, and open up the box. Of course, if our sender and receiver already know each other, 
they can arrange to meet in secret before the message is sent and share the code. Unfortunately, of course, this mechanism is not of that much use in the context of online commerce. And the reason is, in online commerce, you want to enable confidential communication between pairs of parties who have no prior relationship. Right? It's simply untenable for Amazon to have gone into a private room with every possible future customer of Amazon. So we needed a different plan. And that plan came from a trio of California-based mathematicians named Whitfield Diffie, Martin Hellman, and Ralph Merkel, who developed something called public key cryptography. Their scheme turned how encryption had been done for centuries on its head. Let's use our low-tech analogy again to explain the essential idea, which is brilliant, but kind of subtle. The sender puts a message in a box like before, but this time, instead of locking it with her own padlock, she asks the person who will receive the message to buy a padlock and send it to her. When the sender gets the padlock, she uses it to lock the box and then sends it. Now, if someone intercepts the box, they can't open it. In fact, even the sender can't open the box once it's locked. The only person who can open it is the intended recipient, the only person who has the code. Thus, presto, you have something close to perfect security. It took several years and some very clever math to create internet-friendly digital versions of the padlocks and boxes used in our analogy. But work it does, and public key cryptography is the linchpin of secure e-commerce. The public key is used for encrypting, that is, rendering secret, the data that the sender wishes to send confidentially to the receiver. Okay. There's also what's known as the private key, which is the combination used by the receiver in order to take the encrypted data, decrypt them, and produce the original message that's readable. With consumers flocking to Amazon on the basis of their competence in secure, convenient e-commerce, Bezos had persuaded Wall Street to back his money-losing, get-big-fast strategy. But the internet boom that Amazon was part of still seemed tenuous. <laughs> I can see using that exactly as is. I don't mind that it's an ad for Amazon, that's okay. In fact, product placement is something I'm interested in. Uh, I think for, because I'm from the private sector, you might say, I'm okay with some commercial. I love that the Lipton tea bag is a tetrahedron, by the way. Um, so, so here's here's RSA, which is this accomplishes the same thing. Um, that's not it though. So, like I was saying before, what's fun is to. Uh, Take a very large public key that's already been cracked into two primes, kind of like you're not supposed to be able to do. This shows that RSA is insecure if you don't pick a big enough N. But if you pick a big enough N, presumably there's no easy way to factor it. And what we want to show in this teaching module is we kind of use this as a black box for now. This is kind of the most intimidating thing, and I've seen much shorter implementations. But basically, the way that RSA works, as you may or may not know, is you basically take a message and you convert it to hexadecimal or decimal, and then you raise it to a certain power modulo the public key. So you raise it to the seventh power. So you can actually use this in the dot prompt. Like I'll say, um, to make a number out of a phrase, uh, let's see, I have this very simple procedure. <clears throat> you go to the Bin ASCII library and you can import hexlify and unhexlify. And this will take a uh, phrase, a string, like something that you just type, and it will turn it into a hexadecimal number. And there are other ways to write this that don't use eval that are probably more elegant. But in any case, just to see this thing working, I can say make number, 
and then I can say able was I ere I saw Elba. That's a palindrome, supposedly something Napoleon said. Of course, he never said that. And you get back a decimal number. Now, this is Python 2.5. We still have the L hanging off the end of our long integers, but that's going away for anyone who still cares. And um, so when you use RSA, you basically have to raise that to a power. So your ciphertext, let's say this is your regular message, is going to be M for plain text message. And then we're going to make the ciphertext. We're just going to raise that m to the seventh power modulo n, where n is that really huge number. In fact, we can type n out right there. That's n. And actually, um, m to the seventh power is actually bigger than that. It's a much bigger number. So when you raise something modulo, as you know, you don't you don't you divide by the number as you go. This power uh, algorithm actually, I remember early talks with Tim Peters, that this actually doesn't ever have to get this big in order to come out with a smaller number. You basically are dividing as you go. Because there's a modulo there, you never really have to go to the seventh power. You don't first go to the seventh power and then take out all the ends to get the remainder. But that's all technical stuff. Basically, I'm just showing you that We've raised something to the seventh power modulo n. There's no math for going backwards. There's no anti -log or there's no anti logarithm method for. We know it was raised to the seventh power. We can even tell them that. I can tell you directly. I just raised this to the seventh power. Here you go. And you're not going to be able to uh, <clears throat> get the message out unless you know the inverse of n, uh, the inverse of seven modulo. The, what's called the totient of n. And uh, the only way you can know the totient of n, according to our math, is if you know p and q. p and q are the two factors. In which case, the totient, which are all, the number of numbers less than that that have no factors in common with that, uh, is going to be that. It's going to be a big number. And so if I go, I would like to decrypt my ciphertext, I'm going to go back to M, we hope, by taking the ciphertext and raising it to the inverse of 7 uh, modulo the totian, Mod, eh, like that. And then I'm going to say M is another number. Let's, let's see if this worked. I have to unhexify it. I have to turn it back into a phrase from being hexadecimal. And there it is. So for the, for the time that it was C, that's the ciphertext, it's pretty much uncrackable, unless you're the German security agency, in which case you should crack this already. Uh, and then this is the RSA method for, now when I, for decrypting, when, when we have actual more time, to play around and think about it. Uh, we might write little classes like this, and you don't necessarily do it exactly the way I do. But here we instantiate a sender and instantiate a receiver. And the sender has an encrypt method, which is what we just ran. And they return C, they hand it off to the receiver, and the receiver has a decrypt method. And it's the same thing. And then you run a uh, kind of a testing script to make sure that it all works. That looks something like that. And I'm sorry I used Bob and Alice again. <laughs> uh, so that would be kind of a testing of RSA there. So that's what I call the lexical track. It's more the algebraic track. We're not doing that much with the geometry of it. Just to show you kind of the class I'm teaching in Portland like next month. I call it Pythonic Mathematics. And because people are really into animation, and I kind of tell people that Portland is like Toontown, playing off that sort of Disney movie, um, we make a lot of cartoons in Portland. We'd like to make more. And the kind of cartoons we like to make aren't just like Cars and Shrek and those kind of things, but technical animations. 
how are you going to understand about DNA and chemistry and all this stuff unless you have good video? How do you even understand about computers without good video? That's why I think Warriors of the Net, for example, that I was hyping earlier, is a very good sort of cartoon about a very technical subject. And I think cartoons as a medium are kind of in that bandwidth place where I was talking. You've got that lore versus technical subjects um, axis and that bandwidth limitation. With a cartoon, it's easy to sort of swing up into the lore a little bit more uh, and then back down into the technical. And so you don't lose your audience so quick. I think what we geeks have is a high tolerance for technical. So on that graph, we're always out there in the way technical and we forget about the lore. And when you get into the lore, oftentimes it's just to tell some jokes or to lighten things up, quote unquote. But the lore itself doesn't do any work to help you glue the curriculum together. You're not using that lore to be a, a mnemonic for what you're trying to teach. So to get back to my earlier slides, what I'm advocating here is that as open source culture geeks, as a FOSS subculture, as sort of Python nation, when we go out there and teach this stuff to a larger audience, don't forget the lore. Don't just talk about Python, figure out how to fit that into the culture as a whole. And that includes talking about um, cryptography and these other subjects. Uh, yeah? Just a quick question. I was confused about the word lore. Lore. But it's L-O-R-E. Yeah. Okay. And is that culturally specific? I mean, will the law in Japan and in Germany be different from the law in... Yeah, I think, you know, as a teacher, each one of us is most effective teaching the lore that we know. But, you know, another word for lore would be sagas and epics. And you need to have heroes. Like, one of my examples was uh, the whole story of SCO versus IBM. You know, that whole story about finally a company decides to stop Linux. It's just being too successful. So they buy the Unix trademark and they try to go after IBM for contributing so much source code to the Linux kernel, saying, hey, you're really just pirating. Let's be honest now. Let's have a big fight in the courts. Let's have a lawsuit. And let's prove that Linux is really just piracy. And as you know, SCO lost, and they're delisted. They're gone. And we won. So that's a, an epic. It's heroism. The good guys won. OK, so in because it's not a ripoff, the whole point of GNU, and kids love to hear that GNU means GNU is not Linux. Uh, that whole intellectual property thing was understood from the beginning, that we need to code this from scratch. We're not just copying Unix. And all that homework paid off. Uh, so when I teach this stuff, it's a lot about when you make animations, there is two big uh, sort of pipelines. There's the real time where you're able to interact uh, in real time with geometric uh, experience, like, uh, like what we're doing right now, but like a video game. Uh, a game engine, a physics engine. You're there, you're playing, they're all used to that. They know what that's like. And then there's movies like Shrek and Cars and on and on, where what you notice, uh, WALL-E, is that the detail is so much greater than what you're used to getting in a video game. And how is that? And you teach about render farms. <clears throat> and you teach basically about the difference between real-time graphics and render-time graphics. And therefore, you need two different kinds of uh, software. You need a real-time graphics engine and you need a ray tracer. And in the open source world, for a ray tracer, I use the old standby that we've been using for years, which is POV ray. Uh, a lot of us have been using that for a long, long time. It is open source. It was invented on CompuServe before there was an open source license. The GPL hadn't even come into existence yet. So it's not GPL. But it's got basically one of those many kind of open source licenses that are out there. So I include it as FOSS. So this is an example of something my students could ray trace pretty early in the curriculum because I've already written a lot of the scaffolding. What they basically get to look at to start with, they get to eyeball code and they get to go in there and mess with it. So this shape up here is called a mite. I can explain a little more about why we call that a mite. It stands for minimum tetrahedron. This is actually the minimum space filler. If you consider that you're trying to fill space with the same shape without gaps, and you don't want a left-handed and a right-handed, you just want one shape, 
that if you have a truckload of them, you can glue them together and they'll fill space. Pretty basic. Cubes have six faces. And you're looking for a minimum. Minimum in this sense means topologically the fewest possible edges, the fewest possible faces. And a cube has six faces. Too many. You want four faces if possible. Now a regular tetrahedron does not fill space. It has gaps. It only fills space with a regular octahedron, a ratio of 2 to 1. So is there an irregular tetrahedron without left and right that's just itself that fills space? Answer, yes. And what do we call it? Might. And what is might stands for? Minimum tetrahedron. It's the minimum simplest shape that fills space without gaps. I think that's a pretty basic thing to include. And so I have it there. And, and I point out that in the regular geometry class, I'm guessing no one's telling them this. Go ask your teachers, I say. Um, so then when they get down into the code and they know a little about a ray tracing, you know, the easiest, friendliest thing to start doing is turn off faces or not, whether you want to see them or you just want to wireframe. Start playing with the textures. You know, it's like you're user friendly at first, you're not, but you are looking at source code. I think eyeballing source code, I think the first way you start learning how to program is you don't just stare at a white piece of uh, screen and just have that sort of writer's block where I don't know what to do. It's like that's not a good position to put any newbie in. You want them to start from the beginning eyeballing code. And if you think of how you learn to read, you learn to read by reading stuff that's already written. And if you're into teaching language, you know that there's two kinds of memory, basically. There's recall and there's recognition. Recall is when you go to a foreign country and you're expected to talk. That's where you have to recall all the grammar, all the vocabulary, and you, it's all up to you. Recall is really quite difficult. Recognition is all, it's, all the work's being done for you. All you have to do is follow along. And it's often much, much easier to get a recognition vocabulary and read Spanish than it is to, to recall. So the same thing with computer programming. We reinforce recognition a lot before we try to make them recall a whole bunch of stuff. So they get used to just eyeballing source code. And uh, already we can start talking to lingo. The idea of a model, a view, and a controller is pretty basic in today's software world. And I'm basically telling them that the model is like the algebra. It's like the XYZ coordinate system. It's like the math itself. It's the algebra. The visualization is what you get out of the ray tracer or out of the game engine. It's the thing on your screen that you're happy about. It's the eye candy. And the controller is like Python. It's the thing that's gluing these two together. It's taking you from your SQL database, your SQL database, which has all those vertices and vectors in it. That's your model. And through the means of the controller, you're writing a renderable file, which you then send through a ray tracer. And that's your visualization. And you can take those same concepts and apply them to uh, web frameworks or anything else like that down the road. Here's kind of a doctored picture, and then I, I put a visual effect or something. But this is kind of my classroom. I've got the computers, one per child. There's a goal in Saturday Academy that you never have to share equipment. On the other hand, you do want to teach collaboration. So there's kind of a tension there. But you don't, to collaborate doesn't mean you have to share the same physical computer, does it? So, um, you know, I have my box of polyhedra here, and I have my uh, face center cubic lattice that I need them to understand how sphere packing relates. And we do all the stuff about vectors and vector addition, vector subtraction. This is out of the POV ray docs, and it's actually got a lot of nice, you know, stuff you can. Why learn vectors without a ray tracer? It's kind of like a question I would put to sort of Joe, math class teacher. Why are we doing all this fun stuff without the fun? You know, it's like, here's this, here's this topic where we could have colorful polyhedra rotating and we could be talking about world geometry and math. Why don't we take away the computers, take away everything meaningful, just purge it of all value and make them do it with a pencil. And that's where we're at. It's like you took away all the toys to get back to the status quo. Of course, you could say it's budget, but you know a lot of these schools actually have a lot of computers. They just don't know how to use them. Nobody's teaching any programming right now. Um, 
in math class or anywhere else really a lot of the time. Partly why I focus on math class politically <coughs> is because many states are like Oregon. Computer science is very much an elective at the high school level. It's not really something you have to do. A few people might do it, but when the budget gets tight, that's the first thing to go. And when they need a computer science teacher, they'll grab the gym teacher. I have nothing against gym teachers. They can make great computer science teachers. Oh, but I'm just saying it's all very, got that elective flavor of very dispensable. Whereas math has this undeserved um, throne position of being uh, mandatory and required. And so much stress is put on it, and it sucks. So not only is it a monopoly, but it's corrupt. And so we're trying to attack it from various angles uh, because it's weak and deserves to die. Um, but we want the teachers not to go away. We, we're not, we're trying to be friends with the teachers here. We want the teachers to upgrade their skills and instead of fleeing their profession and going off to something better than math teaching, we want them to stay where they are and share this wonderful culture with our uh, students. It's called the Oregon Curriculum Network down here, and my little Oregon flag. Um, so what we do is um, we run the same menu of options against two different frameworks. I show them the code, and in one framework, they pick number three, I, I, CASA, and they get, um, they get a rendered version, and in another version, they get the real-time physics. Now, under the hood, what are we using here? We're using something called Stickworks, which I wrote and which I think I'll get out of the shell and come back in. I want to go through the source code of that some. So let's say Stickworks. A good technique, by the way, probably some of you do this, but in addition to writing comments right in your code, if you're out there trying to explain to other people, like I populate EduSig all the time, which is a, a Python list devoted to education. If you're not on that list and you're in this room, you might want to sign up. It's one of the many Python lists. EduSig, E-D-U-S-I-G, special interest group. As you know, many of the Python uh, things end with SIG. It's a very active group. I've been there from the beginning. There are many others involved. And you know, when I write at length about a module, sometimes I'll just include a link to that posting on a public archive so that when you open your module, instead of reading lots and lots of comments right there, if you really care and you really want to read more, go and look at the actual documents in the on the public list. And you don't have to, you know, you can use any, you can use a news group, anything. So what we do in Stickworks is we basically only create two kinds of object. We create a vector, and what I'm doing is basically wrapping the vector that you get, or the cylinder, I'm sorry, that you get from Visual Python. Visual Python gives you these primitives that you're able to just use directly out of the box. If you've never been to the Visual Python website, it's vpython.org. You can go there now if you want to take a look. The documentation is refreshingly thin in that you don't need a lot uh, to, to start using the API. For example, to get a cylinder to draw, you just have to say what the starting position is, and then you have to give an axis, basically which way is it pointing. <coughs> and then you have to give a radius, how thick is it as a cylinder, and then you have an optional color. And these are like named values, so there can be passed in with a dictionary and all that kind of stuff. And uh, what I don't like, or why I wrap this, is that as soon as you mention a cylinder in vPython, it immediately draws it on the screen. And what I want to do is define all these vectors as objects, but I want, it, I want control over when I actually draw them. So I have a draw method that actually does the instantiation. And in the meantime, I just keep all that XYZ and stuff uh, as part of my class, my, 